We have been looking at the book of Isaiah, the 40th chapter, that kind of a uh, fulcrum point in the whole book of Isaiah because you have such a change uh, that occurs between chapters 39 and 41, and chapter 40 helps explain that and make that transition for us. You know, but if you stop and think about where we've been so far in the first couple of messages of the book, you find that God has made a series of promises to the nation of Israel. And perhaps a, a little bit of background thinking on some of that might help us a lot. You know, we, we, it, promising is one thing. You know, we have promises all the time. Uh, that go on at all different levels and everything that goes with it. Uh, and it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if you could, you know, actually count on the promises of mankind uh, to be fulfilled. You know, a presidential candidate, for instance, promises certain reforms. Uh, if elected, a chief executive officer promises to the board of directors he's going to bring uh, increased profits, you know, and lessened labor costs and so forth. A husband promises that he's going to mow his wife's lawn uh, next week or maybe like sometime. You get the idea. You see, and most of these people, at least some level, uh, have, a, have some uh, sincerity. Uh, some good intentions, you know, uh, concerning carrying on and fulfilling the promises they've made uh, to the different people involved. The, uh, but oftentimes, as we all know, promises are not kept. There's a, a breakdown there, isn't there? Uh, now, that may be for a variety of reasons. It could be a lack of power. Uh, it might be a lack of wisdom. Or it could be what we call a lack of sovereignty. Okay. Now let me explain that to you. The mower breaks and the lawn can't be cut. That's a lack of power. All right. The economy slows down and profits diminish okay. uh, for the CEO. That's a lack of wisdom in handling the affairs of the company. Uh, then you have Congress vetoes a bill or an agenda, uh, and the promises of the reforms are simply not realized. Well, that's a lack of sovereignty. That's a lack of sovereign control over the situation. God had commanded, as we opened the chapter, that Israel was to be comforted. Okay? He ordained that she should repent of her sins, uh, he's found in the very early verses there in verses 3 and 4. And he promised that the people would see the glory of God reestablished as it was revealed uh, to not just Jerusalem or Judea, but all of mankind. And he then went on you know, to state that people like grass would just wither uh, and pass and that humanity's glory uh, in verses six and eight, six through eight would fade. He commanded that the nation climb to mount to the very top of the mountains and proclaim, "Behold your God." And verses ten and eleven, as we close last Lord's Day, uh, God promised that He would return, the wicked would be judged, and the righteous would be rewarded, as He gathered the elect from the four corners of the earth and gathered the righteous from within the land of Israel to rule and reign with him. Now, Israel, you see, had, was currently, historically, contextually, enslaved by Babylon. It's right at the very end of that 70 years, just prior to the Medo-Persians coming. Uh, and the nation was enslaved by idolatry, poverty, oppression, and had been now for decades under the Babylonian rule. And God's promises through the pen of Isaiah here in chapter 40 would have been considered 
lofty, perhaps, far-fetched, not realizable, not likely to happen, you know, uh, whatever terminology that you might hear over coffee. Okay? Uh, the city of Babylon, if we step back for just a moment, Babylon was the capital city of the uh, Babylonian Empire. That mind almost clicked on me. The city of Babylon was enclosed by a wall, common in those times, but it was rather notable. It was that wall was over 50 miles long. It encompassed that much of, of the city. Uh, it was 310 feet high, and it had embattlements, some, what, 250 of those as watchtowers and various uh, military embattlements built on, even on top of that 310 foot high wall. Uh, it was 80 feet thick, okay? uh, but even by today's standards, the description of the capital of the Babylonian Empire is pretty impressive. It really was. On top of that, they had accumulated 20 years of food that was stored inside the city, and it had a branch of the Euphrates River that ran underneath us walls to make sure that it was well supplied with water if the enemy ever laid any type of siege to the city. By historical standards, it was considered to be impregnable. And there was no culture that was seen as an actual threat to the capital city of the Babylonian Empire. Okay? And when you stop and think about it, can you uh, then, you know, really, you, you should be able to kind of identify with King Nebuchadnezzar of, the day, of Daniel's day, uh, that went up on his rooftop and looked out over the capital city of his empire and said this, is, it, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Okay. Uh, now, that's what the nation of Israel, in total subjugation to that same emperor, uh, and that same empire was facing when God gives his promises through the prophet Isaiah. And they look around and they say, wow, you know, look at everything that is here. God is promising them deliverance. God is promising them comfort. God is promising them restoration, that they will be gathered. And they look at these things and they go, how valid is the promises? Well, promises are based upon the character and the ability of whoever's making the promise, okay? uh, isn't it? And that's what we want to explore. Beginning in verse 12, the, uh, Isaiah writes down, because God, as God directs, Who hath measured the waters in the hall of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales in the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or been his counselor and in teaching him? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment or knowledge or showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he takes up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient as a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. I have to point out to you that the passage does go on. Down through verse 26, you have additional illustration of the majesty and the power and the awesomeness of a sovereign God, the same God who is making these promises to Israel. For the sake of time, I'm going to focus in on just these verses that we have this morning, and then we'll see what the Lord brings. Let's talk about the infinite power of God. Did you see that in verse 12? Okay. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, meted out heaven with the span, comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed in the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? 
you know, the infinite power of God himself. The Jewish people have been enslaved now for decades to the Babylonian Empire. And they have, uh, by the way, this is largely because of idolatry and their sin, you know, that God has placed them into bondage because they have failed to be obedient to the Mosaic Law Covenant okay, of the Old Testament era. Okay? Uh, if you read Ezekiel 11 sometimes, the first half the chapter, you'll find that idolatry was running rampant, the leadership was corrupt uh, and villainous. I mean, you know, you just pick out anything uh, often that we all see right now currently in our own nation, and you see a very similar type of thing. God said, in essence, in Ezekiel, uh, that if you want idolatry, as the norm, he said, I'll show you idolatry and withdrew his hand of blessing and essentially gave them over to a reprobate mind. Okay. Uh, you can read Romans chapter 1, the last uh, 14, 15 verses, starting with verse 18, and you'll find that. Okay. The people during that captivity of 70 years had strayed far from God. God had withdrawn his blessing, not his sovereignty, but had withdrawn his blessing because the people's refusal to walk righteously in, in front of him. Now, the, the purpose of calling back Israel, now you see in a series of rhetorical questions, don't you? Did you pick up on that? I trust you did. Yeah. Uh, it, it, in verse 12, it says, who? Who's done these things? Who has the ability? Who has the power? to possibly do everything that is listed in here. You know, the waters, the mountains, the dust, and so forth. The answer, of course, is the God of Israel. Okay? The biblical God, the God of Israel. It wasn't the heathen idols that they had been worshiping for some 70 years uh, in any way or form. Uh, it was, uh, and... How small, I mean, stop and talk, think about it. How, how, you cup your hand together. Okay? Go ahead, give it a try. Cup your hand together. How much water can fit in there? Not too much, is there? You know, it's kind of a slurp, slurp, and half of it runs down in front of you when you try to drink something that way. Okay? Uh, not much, a very finite, very small portion. God, however, measures the oceans, the seas, the rivers, the streams, the lakes, the ponds, uh, and he has placed them perfectly according to his plan to sustain life throughout the world as we know it. Without water, you know, our world would cease to exist. Okay? God's hand span is infinite, isn't it? Stop and think about it. It is infinite. That's what's being described. You know, he placed the heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, the universe itself, the Milky Way galaxy, into its place just exactly the way he chose to do it. He made them of precise size, each of the planets, each of the heavenly bodies. Uh, he knew their movements. He knew their paths. He knew how they would circle, how they would rotate. Uh, he's got them the right distance to have the right amount of heat to provide gravity, you know, uh, everything that you can think of. And God did this with one handful in the span of his hand. That's the type of God that is the biblical God, the God of our faith, okay? The measure it talks about, did you see that? It, uh, it, it talks about who hath measured the waters, uh, a measure is, biblically Old Testament, is a third of an ephah. You know, now that's going to really narrow it down for you if you don't know what that is. Uh, think of a bushel basket, okay? Uh, just, you know, one of the, you know, just er, like this. That, that's about what you're looking at, you know. But he says, in contrast, he says, God has a container that can measure all of the dust of the earth. Now, how small in either bulk or weight is the quantity that can be measured? You know, it depends upon what kind of scale you have, isn't it? 
You know, if you have one of these little balance scales or a butcher scale, or maybe you've got a bathroom scale, maybe you've got one for, you know, uh, weighing cattle, you know, or maybe even elephants for all I know. There's probably some type of scale out there somewhere uh, for a variety of things, but they're all finite, aren't they? They're all limited, even though they may be large by human perspective, they are very small when it comes to the created universe. He says, the God of Israel has a scale that he measures mountain chains in, that he drops Mount Everest into. And it, it's, a, it's, you know, he has appointed the mountains in the exact place, the exact size, as he's caused the upthrust and the plate shifts and the, at the tectonic level, you know, and all of the volcanic activity that has caused things to rise and fall. And we're just talking about what we see, let alone what covers the floor of the oceans that comprise 75% of the global surface. It's full of mountains and valleys and everything go, that goes with it. Okay? it uh, the God of Israel is the only being that can measure the immeasurable. Yes, he can. Uh, beyond anything that mankind can comprehend. So why does Isaiah wind up being used to single out water, the heavens, earth, mountains, and hills as the object? Why didn't God come up with something else? Why did he choose those things? Well, usually we just let these things zip right by. But we say, well, that's just the general thing. Shove it in, boom, go on to the next verse or the next passage. You know, uh, let me, however, provide a bit of historical context. Okay? Uh, water is significant in its historical context. Water ran in the Euphrates River underneath the impregnable walls of the capital city okay, of Babylon itself. Okay. The water was that which sustained life in the, for the capital city of Babylonia. I mean, this was everything that was there. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had built on top of part of the city on, on a good portion of his palace that was huge, what the ancients came to know as the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It was considered by the Greeks uh, as be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was very intricate, very involved, and massive. It had a, a whole system of pulling water by the buckets out of that Euphrates River and winding up getting it clear to the top and watering these acre upon acre you know, of mountains and gardens that bloomed and blossomed and produced fruit and shade and everything you can think of. You know, water was a very key issue, wasn't it? it uh, you find water mentioned, for instance, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, the whole cycle of the, the importance of it. You know, how the vapor rises off the oceans and the wind moves that vapor and when it hits mountains, you know, it condenses and falls and either snow or rain or whatever, uh, you know, and replenishes the earth and then cycles out, goes down through the rivers and back out into the oceans. You know, God designed all that. Okay? It's, it's a fantastic thing. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, you know, when you start talking about the signs of things with the entire cosmos, that is involved in God's plan and his power. Uh, dig around and find a copy of, it's uh, Louis Giglio, isn't it? You know, you know it, it talks about how big is your God. I mean, that's, I don't know if I've forgotten what the title actually is. You guys remember? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, but I know, yeah, I can remember watching it with those guys. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's amazing when you stop and think about what God has done. You know, the earth is nothing but a speck inside of the Milky Way galaxy, and that's just one of thousands of galaxies that God put into place. 
and the mountains and the streams and everything are perfect in their cycles and placement. You know, I mean, gravity, everything that goes, I mean, just amazing. The centrifugal force of the earth, I mean, it's just, it's just a fascinating study. It really is, okay? It, uh, you know, heaven is important, okay? If you, if you move away from water, you see heaven is important. You know, it's, uh, you know, we don't get this again, okay? That's why I pause to talk about this. You know, Nebuchadnezzar and his successors believed themselves to be absolute monarchs, as did most monarchs of most cultures in especially Old Testament times. He considered Babylon to be invincible, okay? And it was because of that his rule and his kingdom were impossible to, uh, to rebel against. He had the power to crush any opposition. He was supreme. Okay? But he did not realize until Daniel, the slave kid, came by, as recorded in chapter 2 of Daniel, and told him that there is a God in heaven that reveals the secrets and at the end of the age, it would be God who would set up a kingdom that would destroy all earthly kingdoms. Okay. The stone cut without hands. More on that in just a moment. Nebuchadnezzar winds up, you remember, going insane for a seven-year period in chapter 5 uh, of the book of Daniel because he would not recognize and refuse to recognize that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whoever he chooses to do so. Yeah, that's the way it works. The earth, mountains, and hills are important, not particularly to us, but the chief deity of the Babylonians was, uh, uh, was Marduk. Uh, Marduk, the name means the great mountain. You see, the... The Babylonians believed that their gods all came out of the mountains. Okay. And they, uh, you know, the, <laughs> what the sacred mountain, the greatest mountain, they called the mountain of the lambs. Okay. All their heathen temples resembled mountains. Okay. I mean, you go back and you dig through and that's what you find out. But Daniel speaks of a stone cut without hands that comes and crushes the image uh, found in Daniel chapter 2 of the earthly kingdoms of the world, including the Babylonians. Okay. King of kings, Lord of lords. Uh, you know, John called him the I am, you know, the seven I am's and so forth found in the gospel. You know, that's, you want something mind-boggling? You know, that means that God is the only uncaused cause. Okay? By human definitions and terminology is a complete contradiction. Before there was anything, I existed. But wait a minute. How can you have anything exist before anything existed? That's God. That's the God of Scripture. That's the God of the Israelite nation. It was true then. It is true today. Okay? And we find that in the history that you need to understand to get the richness of it in the, from the book of Daniel, you find that God is just about ready to, but, to judge Babylon. He comes out with that inscription. You remember? A fantastic thing of... All of a sudden, in the midst of this giant feast by Nebuchadnezzar's successor, a couple of generations down, uh, and you hit the handwriting on the wall, up on the top of it, up there, Mini, Mini, Tico, Ufarsin, okay? uh, the, the term, uh, the interpretation that tells you right in Scripture in the book of Daniel 5 that God hath numbered your kingdom and finished it. That's Mene, Tekel, says you are weighed into balances, the scales, and found lacking. And Perez, which is the interpretation of the Ufarsin word, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Okay. 
weighed in the balances and found wanting and your kingdom is divided and taken from you. History records, of course, that the very night that those, that hand appeared uh, and wrote <laughs> that the kingdom fell, that you know, the uh, Belshazzar uh, had been destroyed. He was killed. He was the ruling monarch of, the, of that impregnable city. And the Mede Persians just diverted the water source going down the river and marched in underneath the walls and pretty much, as we'd say today, took the whole city without firing a shot. Okay. And, uh, so they understood the importance of that being able to conquer that impregnable city and the Babylonian Empire fell to the Medo-Persian. So what that would indicate then historically to the Jew of that time, 539 B.C., was God was holding the Babylonians in judgment. And that as he started Isaiah 40, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, on an initial basis and as a historical context, God was in the process of beginning to bring that comfort because of his promises to the nation of Israel. Okay. All of that and more. Okay. A lot of it. Verses 13 and 14 are here in front of us. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor has taught him? Whom did God take counsel with or the, for instruction? Who taught him how to pass out righteous judgment? Who taught him how to understand, have knowledge and discernment in the way of understanding? Obviously, more rhetorical questions. Nobody. You know, the only appropriate answer is no one. He preexisted. He's the one who is the actual standard for the answer to all of those questions. When Tim wrote, uh, read to us our scripture reading from the book of Job, you have just one of many other passages that say there is no God like the biblical God. There is no God like the God of Israel. There is no God like the God of Christianity. These, you know, th this is the stellar God that is here. It, uh, the, it, it's uh, who can measure Yahweh? Who can measure the God of the Bible? You can't come up with limits. It's just impossible to do so. We can't even imagine terminology that would do that. And with that, in the, the book of Daniel, in the midst of Babylonian captivity, when the events of Daniel mostly took place, chapter 2, it says that Nebuchadnezzar had a great dream. He had that dream out on uh, the image, out on the plane, didn't he? In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream about this giant tree who grew vertically all the way to the heavens and horizontally covered the whole earth. And he wanted to know what that meant as well. In Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar saw that handwriting on the wall and he couldn't interpret it. And in all cases, the king sent for his advisors, his human advisors, and they went, we don't know. No, we don't have a clue. And said, but there's a Jewish kid that you might want us to connect with. And Daniel came in and said, this is what it means, this is what it means, this is what it means. Okay? You know, human knowledge, human understanding, human wisdom all failed over and over and over. But Daniel, the servant of El Elyon, the most high God, stepped into the place and gave the king the correct interpretation. Each interpretation that I've just spoken of in 2, 4, and 5 all ended with judgment. Nebuchadnezzar went mad. Following the dream in chapter 4, the image was crushed by the stone made without hands in chapter 2, and the handwriting on the wall, well, as I've already mentioned, said that the kingdom would fall, okay, which it did. So no one can instruct the God of the Bible. He alone possesses the perfect wisdom, the perfect judgment, the perfect discernment, and he's got the power 
to back it up, which shows us verses 15, 16, and 17, the absolute sovereign control, the power that God has to go with this. Behold, the nations are like a drop of a bucket, are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he takes up the isles as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, the beast thereof sufficient for an offering. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him as less than nothing and in vanity. You know, to say that God is sovereign means that he is the absolute ruler of the universe. He has the knowledge, he has the wisdom, he has the power, he has the authority, he has the right to do just as he chooses, and he doesn't owe anyone anything. It's his and his alone. The only what you and I would call restrictions or perhaps prohibitions, uh, I'd rather use restrictions, are self-imposed by his character. In other words, since he is total righteousness he cannot do unrighteousness <clears throat> since he is total truth he cannot lie since he is totally justice he can never allow injustice okay? as, as applied to him it simply can't done it, no one can resist what God has the nations are as a drop of a bucket now I imagine that as you read this, as I have many times over the years, we put like a drop in a bucket, right? That's probably where the terminology actually comes from. But that's not what it says. It says drop of a bucket. Okay? Just to explain the difference, we know what drop in a bucket is. You got a bucket, you go in and drop it. Okay? That's what mine okay? what, That's what yours says. Yours is wrong. <laughs> okay? Yeah, if that's what yours says, yours is wrong. It's drop of a bucket. The, the picture is when you drew a bucket of water out of a well. In biblical times, there was always water that ran off the outside of the bucket, right? It went drip, 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 drop, drop, and it went flip and hit the sand and it was absorbed by the dirt, the sand and so forth. That wasn't the usable part of the whole, you know, filling a bucket full of water, was it? Okay. The text is speaking of the water that runs down the outside of the bucket, not as you and I think of as a drop in a bucket. You know, the idea here is that like a speck of sand or one drop, it cannot affect in any way or influence the weight that is on the scale, the weight of the water inside and so forth. To God, all the islands of the known universe, but in its context, the islands surrounding that area of Israel were like the drip that fell off the outside of a bucket. Totally insignificant is probably as good a way to put it as any. We may think it's a big deal. He talks about the cedars of Lebanon. In biblical times, these things were world famous. They were huge, big trees. Uh, and, you know, Nebuchadnezzar wrote in his personal diary after having traveled through there, they were mighty cedars, tall and strong, and of costly value, whose dark forms towered aloft the massive growth of Lebanon. Now, in his military campaigns, he personally saw and then recorded that as well. But it tells us that if you took, in biblical times, all of the tree, cedar trees in all of Lebanon, it would not be sufficient for one burnt offering in the sight of God. In fact, it goes on and talks about, if you take a look at it, he says, all of the beasts, he said, that wouldn't be one a giant offering of all of the beasts that were on top of all of the cedar trees of all of Lebanon and it 
would be totally insignificant. It would be like a speck of sand in comparison. It would be simply like the drip coming off the edge of a water bucket, everything that goes with it. So that's pretty amazing, it really is. He tells us in verse 17 as we wrap it here, All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. <laughs> kind of reminds you of Ecclesiastes again, doesn't it? Vanity of vanity, all is vanity, saith the preacher. Empty, useless, futile, insignificant, of no value. You can pick all that out or put it together or pick out the one you want, and that's what vanity means, the, the biblical usage of that term. Okay. It says all that mankind has put together, all of the stuff that we think is so fantastic and so great and so magnificent, God looks at it and laughs. He says, no, nah. go back and read Psalm 2. You've got the same thing regarding that laughter in derision that is there. It's not that God doesn't love any people outside of Israel. He certainly does. We know that for, for, for clearly. But as nationally, politically identified groups, God says they're meaningless. They think they're really doing something fantastic. But he says, they're just like a grain of sand. He says, compared to my power, my sovereignty, uh, nope, not going to work. It says that, on the other hand, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8 says that Israel is the apple of God's eye. Isaiah 46 says, I will place salvation in Zion, Jerusalem, for Israel my glory. Those of you that have, you know, read Israel My Glory magazine by Friends of Israel, that's where they get the title for that book. Behold, he that keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Psalm 121. And that's just a few of many that guarantee God's relationship to national Israel. That's not talking about spiritual redemption. That's in a different subject but talking about the future and the keeping hand of the eternal God. God doesn't lie. Tells us that in Numbers, tells us that in the book of Titus, a number of other places. You know, he's not like a man. When God then speaks to Israel and promises Israel, he says that even though you are enslaved by Babylon, you will be comforted. This is the God who promised a redeemer. We look at this time of year, and God for century upon century had promised that one would come that would set the spiritual fellowship of man back into its proper place. He gave that promise to Adam and Eve when he kicked them out of the garden. Uh, theologically, he expelled them. But when he kicked them out of the garden, he said, no. He said, I, he said, you won't be able to restore fellowship. But I will be. I will restore. I will send the seed of the woman who will restore. Yes, everything and that and more that is involved. So in the ultimate sense, we are talking about the future from the time of Isaiah penning this epistle. In its context, historical context, we're talking about the Medo-Persians freeing up Israel from the bondage of the Babylonians and the Medo-Persian Empire was a lot more gracious and easy to get along with as the rulers of the known world at that time than the Babylonians were. But in the ultimate sense, he's looking clear down through history and God is laying down that in the future, God is going to restore Israel. And another step in that process was that Jewish baby that was born in that manger 2,000 years ago. Because now you have the spiritual dimension that is brought to the fore. Okay. Emmanuel, God with us. Wow, fun stuff to see all of these things like a giant jigsaw puzzle all snap into place. And you begin to see a much broader, richer, more colorful picture when you even look at the writings in Isaiah chapter 40. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for blessing us with such a rich text. And we ask, Lord, this time of the year that we would just delight ourselves in the God uh, that is supreme, the God who is sovereign, the God who no one can question because you are, in fact, not only all-knowing, but you are also all gracious and all righteous. You don't make mistakes. You don't lie. You're not conning mankind when you say that there is one way through the finished work of Christ to get to heaven. So we praise you for watching over and guiding, and we ask, Lord, that this Christmas season might be a little richer because we understand Isaiah 40 a little better. In Christ's name, amen.